I think we got a good program lined up for you today, and hopefully you guys will have a lot of questions for all the speakers, and hopefully all the speakers can answer them. And um, you were giving a folder, I guess, when you came in and registered, and, and there are some, some of the speakers have handouts, and they may reference them when they give their talk, so, so that's where all the, uh, the handouts are. Um, there's a few other things in there that I'll talk about as we, as we go out through the day, but feel free to, to browse through that packet. Uh, this um, meeting does qualify for full recertification as a private pesticide applicator. I'll have a sign-up sheet, of course, I'll hand, we'll start this around probably after lunch, so everyone has to uh, stay around and, and, and sign it. And actually, the MDA is the last, the last speaker, so uh, it's going to be kind of hard to, to sign it before he, he leaves. But, but anyway, but it'll be up here, and again, we'll, we'll probably pass it around starting after lunch. And also, I'm not sure how many people need uh, certified crop uh, uh, consulting credits. Um, we do have this meeting is um, qualified for, I think, five credits. So I'll have the sign-up sheet up here. Feel free to come up at any time to sign it. So we'll start with our first speaker today, Dave Myers, over from uh, Anne Arundel County. Dave's been here many, if not every year, giving a, uh, a presentation on things that he's been doing over um, on his side of the world and um, maybe some new information that we don't know. And, um, but I asked Dave to, sp to speak a little bit about sprayer technology for fruit, for fruit culture. And uh, it may be a review for a lot of you. Sometimes we get new growers here that, that might, might need this kind of information. So hopefully it'll be, uh, I'm sure it'll be beneficial to everybody. And um, so, so anyway, without further ado, Dave Meyer. Thanks, Dave. You bet. Thanks, Mike, and appreciate the opportunity to come out again. Just, um, I had a few loose ends from a last talk that I did, so we'll cover a few loose ends, and then we'll look into some sprayer technology, just some thoughts and things that I need, not that anything's probably that new or earth shattering, but uh, certainly things that uh, we need to be reminded of when it comes to you and our, using our sprayers t to their maximum, um, especially when we all recognize how much everything costs in this world, especially those, um, those bills that we get for pesticides. So again, we want to make sure we do what we can to make sure everything does the best value we can get out of it. So I have this title then, Sprayer Technology for Fruit Culture, and so we'll, we'll certainly delve into that. The, um, just want to remind you that we do have a fruit team at Southern Maryland and pictures of Southern Maryland was historically a tobacco farm and we do an awful lot of vegetable work over here on this hillside so we have a vineyard fruit blocks and some things there and myself Ben Beal, Herb Reed, other county agents over in Southern Maryland region and then Dr. Joe Field and Dr. Chris Walsh um, work, work together on that team, team effort over there for fruit production and it's a lot of fun and this is my, I remember I'm, I mentioned this to you last year, this is my new project to have a um, a, a Streuops visa <laughs> from Baden-Württemberg, Germany, and uh, Deutschland. <laughs> and so I think, man, that's not beautiful. That's on the hills off the Rhine River. So I'm thinking that's kind of a nice concept. So lo and behold, I started my meadow orchard in 2011. So I just, like I say, I mentioned this before. But it's an idea of this eclectic mix of fruit and the idea is maybe introduce a lot of different things and new things. And the idea is to have a couple of trees coming in so you're supplying a little fruit market to have a lot of different variety coming in and a chance, chance for me to play with a lot of different things. So I'm kind of enjoying the Stroy Alps Visa or the Meadow Orchard and uh, I'm going a little bit organic on it. Uh, that's, that's a real stretch for me, believe me. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always, they call me nozzle head and that's for good reasons. But um, I am moving on softer on the fruit on the top end. I'm, not, I'm a weed scientist by formal training. I'm not going to hoe, so I'm not giving up herbicides on the floor. And I'm also not going to give up fertilizers. So I'm saying it's, it's soft up top and hard on bottom. And that's the way I'm going to approach that. Uh, this meadow orchard, actually this year I'm going to start a meadow bush in a hops yard. So kind of neat, uh, kind of, we took out the old apple block and that's anyone who's ever seen hops grow. I happened to wit witness some of them growing in Anne Arundel County, kind of got excited about them. And there's kind of a, actually a new Maryland hops society forming, uh, hops alliance uh, with the Northeast Hops Alliance. Maryland's formed a chapter. In fact, they're having a kickoff meeting March 1st up in Frederick if you're interested in hops at all. So I'm going to have a bush, meadow bush and a meadow tree fruit orchard at Upper Marlboro and kind of excited about that. Remember last time I was here I talked about apple rootstock, fire blight, and like, like I said I'm just tying up some loose ends. And we talked about these Geneva 16 um, being tolerant to fire blight and also the G30s and getting us down into this full dwarfing range of trees making those comparisons between bud 9 and M9. And so we put a planting in and I terminated that planting. We went from 2008 to 2012, five years, and those are the varieties um, that did well, Rule Court, Macoon, Ginger Gold, Pioneer Mac, and Honeycrisp. And uh, um, actually Honeycrisp kind of failed and we, we kind of knew that up front. 
Uh, it was a graft incompatibility. But um, I would just want to say thank you to Adams County Nursery. There's the trees at the time of termination. Um, and so, again, five years into the project. I, that was probably about the fourth year there. And, uh, of course, we were looking at fire blight and kind of let fire blight kind of, kind of have its course, if you will. So there's some blossom blight and, of course, trauma blight. I don't know if you can see it in there, but there's plenty of trauma blight in there from a little bit of uh, high wind. And um, then we looked at graft union necrosis, and I did some graft incompatibility studies because that's always an issue when you have new rootstocks. Our variety is going to be, uh, be compatible. And so we found out that Honeycrisp was not. And uh, over the course of the five years, as you reported, I was somewhat optimistic. I've become a lot more optimistic as I terminated the study and just compared healthy to dead or weak trees that were dying from graft, graft dying or dead from graft, graft, graft union necrosis and actually had statistical differences once I grouped, took out the trees that had incompatibilities. And actually saw 80%, the G16, um, had 80% after five years healthy trees. And I believe that that makes it a little bit more meritable for us to actually have a full dwarf tree on those, uh, if we have good compatibility between the Skyon and the uh, rootstock, that I think, I believe the G16 is pretty worthy. So that's kind of a, I, I'm reporting a much more optimistic. I presented this at the um, Shenandoah Fruit Workers Conference and with the full details. But I just want to share that slide. And you can see I only got 50%. And that's kind of been historic, historical for me to only get 50% of my M9 bud 9 trees survive fire blight for the first five years. Anyone have seen some of those similar problems? And, and uh, so I actually saw, and this was letting fire blight run pretty rampant to only have 20% dead or weak trees at the course of five years. So I thought that that was pretty promising. So, so if you're going to plant um, the full dwarfs, I would recommend the G16s. And I didn't look at the G30s, so maybe that's an opportunity too with the semi-dwarf. Hey, hey, so, compare, yep. compare the size of the G16s? Um, they were real comparable in size. I really couldn't distinguish caliper. I didn't really do too much caliper di dis different differentiation in it, but they really were about the same size tree. You really couldn't spot them. You couldn't spot the difference out there as far as actual growth. So that's, uh, um, just want to remind you, I do update this little multi-fruit tree cover spray, and I think this kind of fits in with this idea of sprayer tech, is what do we, what do we possibly can afford to put in, in our spray cabinet each year? And I know a lot of you have multi-tree and multi-small fruit plantings, and so I do a little cover sheet, every, a little sheet every year to kind of, my cheat sheet helps me in my vineyard and orchard, act, orchard and vineyard activities. <coughs> And so that's online and updated. It really didn't change much from last year. So if you have that, you, you'll probably help. Also, you're, you're well aware of FRAC, IRAC, and HRAC. These aren't countries, right? They sound like countries, but, but they're not. Um, they are actually these new resistant action committees that have been formed. And of course, you get these number designations. And on that spray sheet, I have the number designations too. So I just wanted to, to let you know that as you rotate those stocks of chemistries. And that's a real part of spraying. So let's kind of delve into this. Well, what are we doing out there with sprayers? And I know. Um, everyone in here, there's large growers, there's small growers, there's people that are, want to become growers. There's a lot of diversity here in this crowd. And um, what I would say is, you know, you have to make a wise investment in that sprayer technology and recognize that uh, whether you're going to, you know, go with organic or go conventional, you, you have to spray. The spraying is inevitable. You're going to have pests. Um, and if you're not doing something out there to take care of that, the likelihood of getting fruit is almost zero. <laughs> So it's just, it's just that, uh, that's just the reality of life. And so spraying then is how do we make sure that when we put that sprayer in the field, it's doing what we want it to do. And what I have found with machinery in general is that uh, it typically does not do what we want it to do it the first time we put it in the field. And certainly uh, I would always say when you buy a piece of machinery, have the dealer come out and do prep work with you. But, you know, if it's a sprayer, get some water in there, take it out, you know, look at what kind of the, you know, that's a good time when you have something that's nice and clean and you just put some water in there. Watch what those nozzles are doing. You know, if it's an, if it's an air blast sprayer, you know, make sure it's set up so that the heavier nozzles are in this range. You've got lighter nozzles. Know about where your canopy is going to be and, and then start doing some actual calibration and, and really good um, measurements quantifying exactly what's coming out of each one of those nozzles. And, of course, it gets really cheap, you know, high end, and it can get much more expensive and much larger than that from air blast and cannon sprayers. Uh, to small little sprayers, I think that I got one like that about $125, and I do most of my herbicide applications with a little Kubota and a little sprayer like that for laying down herbicides. And certainly something like this could be good for herbicide or even cluster spraying if you just want to put some stolid oil on. And of course a vineyard sprayer gets special design for some of these things. So there's a lot of things we can do with sprayer technology, 
And uh, keep in mind that you know this one might start at around seven, eight thousand. You know, probably same comparable price range: one hundred and fifteen dollars, three hundred dollars, you know, fifteen hundred dollars. So you know, it's, you have to kind of si appropriately size the sprayer and the amount of investment that you want to make. Uh, the I the goal is to make money, right? So you can easily not make money if, if you got one acre and you buy that. <laughs> it's going to be a long time to make money <laughs> unless you buy it used or something. So keep that in mind that it really can be. But you know, remember before, I, uh, herbicides are something that I really value as a weed scientist and recognize the utility of them. And you think about, you think about the investment of that and then to just allow the weeds to overtake that investment like that. I mean, I mean that looks you know, like that's approaching an acre. That's a 10 grand investment you know, for a vineyard of that size and then just let the weeds have it. That's a total loss of money at that point. So at least you're going to reinvest another six grand in vines um, when, you, when you dig that, dig out of that <laughs> the next spring. So again, just, just herbicides themselves, just a few hundred dollars pro properly applied can make all the difference in the world. And it can look like that, right? This is the vineyard at Upper Marlboro. So this is going into the second year. In fact, we're already cropping at 25% the second year. Remember I taught um, how important it was in our region, the Bay region, to take advantage of fruiting the second year. Textbooks will always tell you two, three years out, but I'm here to tell you that if you get things established well the first year with good weed control, uh, with good cover sprays, even while the vines are growing, to keep the foliage going, um, and then you can actually fruit the second year. And in vineyards, I would expect to fruit about 25% crop the second year if cordon is laid down. And the same with peaches. I made the mistake of not um, fruiting a veed system the second year, and all I had then was exponential growth. And if I would have put on a light crop, I would have kept those trees in check. So if you have a good opportunity here in this region to fruit the second year at some percentage, depending on how much growth you get in that first year. So make sure you take advantage of that. And of course, you can see that's fairly easy to, to keep weeds control down through here with just a, you know, one pass on each side with a, with a sprayer either by hand or a wand directed in that, uh, in that vicinity. The, um, and make sure you don't use Roundup. <coughs> Put that out of your mind <laughs> when you're establishing that you're not going to use Roundup <laughs> because that's another way to stop, set, your, set your back and take your profits away uh, by getting Roundup systemic in the plant. Anyone ever been to cdms.net? That's a great website. If you haven't been there, make it a point to jot it down, uh, cdms.net. It's chemical management data system. And you go in here, and you, it's, it's kind of hard to find, but see where it says services? It doesn't really jump out as, as to where you would, once you get to this website, as to where you would intuitively go. But if you, if you hold your cursor on services, this little box pops up, and you go down to labels and material safety data sheets. And from that point, you can get any label you want. And Prowl came out a couple years ago for non-bearing orchards. And I just wanted to see what the label said. And if you don't have to buy the Prowl or you even have to go to the deal, or you can just go right, right, to, the, right to the site and find out exactly what, uh, what the label says. And you can see, I don't know, well, you can't see here, but it'll tell you, you know, how many pages I cut and pasted. But it'll tell you how many pages it has in that label. And you can scroll down through the entirety of that label. And it's usually a very current label. So it's, it's usually the one that's going on in that package year. So I find them that they keep it very current. So. So I think that's a really nice website. So make sure you go there. If you're looking at chemistry and you're looking at new products, so that's the first place I go. And if someone asks me about a product that I'm not aware of, that's the first place I go while they're on the phone. I say, well, let's take a look at the label. And that's, that's just a beautiful website. So let's, let's kind of delve into spraying equipment a little bit. And, um, you know, when we talk about sprayers, um, the, uh, there's a lot of plumbing involved. And there's, it's complex. There's some complexity to it to make it function the way it's um, supposed to, to function. So first thing you have to do is you have to really just look at the sprayer and kind of understand, well, well, okay, how is this pump? Where, you know, where's the suction? How about the bypass and all the things, agitation, what's gonna keep some of these products? And we know a lot of these orchard products, those wettable powders, if we're still using those, or even some of those dry flowables, they'll settle right out in the tank, right? And so, you know, we just, you just sit down for a little while or decide to go have lunch or whatever and go out and spray. Next thing you know, you got this stuff, this cake at the bottom of the thing. So I would, you know, keep the thing agitated and to make sure the agitation components are, are properly working, and it has a lot to do with pressure regulation and bypass. And, um, and then we get into nozzle tip selection. Of course, when we talk about an orchard sprayer, we're probably talking about ceramic, and we're talking about full cones. And we got, so that gives a very nice uh, pattern that catches in that, that, that air, that directed air, air stream. And you know, then we have that really nice uh, plume of, of coverage. 
And so having the right nozzles, of course, ceramic nozzles cost more, but they also give you about 10 times the, wear, the life. And keep in mind that all nozzles, um, you know, when we look at nozzle tip selection, that uh, we, we buy the best nozzle that you can possibly afford. They'll pay you back. Uh, ceramics, the, the hardest and the longest in wearing. Uh, the hardened stainless steel would be next, and then regular stainless, and then you probably could go to uh, plastic and brass. And so knowing what nozzles to use and, and the potential life of that nozzle is really critical when it comes to sprayer setup. And of course, with our orchard sprayers, we're going to use ceramic because of the amount of abrasive materials are going to go through that nozzle. And you can really look at nozzles. Um, they really, it's amazing how um, they have wear, wear um, uh, records for them. And if you watched the pattern and they looked at, really looked at patterns of nozzles, and it's always good to keep a couple new nozzles on the side just to make some comparisons and also do some, um, um, some calibration where you actually hook tubes to each one of the nozzles on the sprayer and find out the delivery. And if they vary by more than 10%, this is something to do in the wintertime, right? This is, this is what you do in the wintertime. You don't do this in the spray season. So you bring the sprayer in, and you find out the output of each one of those nozzles, and you compare it to a new nozzle. And then if it's more than 10%, it's time to change it. And it's amazing how fast these nozzles wear. It depends on the number of acreage we put through a sprayer, the exact number of hours are in the book. So if you go to T-Jet, it'll tell you right on there the number of hours that's anticipated for that nozzle, the life of that nozzle, and I find that pretty true. So if you haven't delved into that with your sprayer, and a lot of times we just drag the sprayer out every year, right, and we just go to the field with it. <laughs> and as long as there's something coming out of the end of it, we probably don't pay much attention to it. But we probably really should, if we want good thorough coverage, and you think about the cost of some of these materials you're putting out there, 10 to 20% more materials, a big bill to pay. And so again, it's really important. The crop, crop sprayers, crop guys have known this for years because they, they spray hundreds of acres, thousands of acres, and they know what sprayer nozzle life means to the pocketbook. Okay, so I think maybe we need to evaluate ourselves a little bit more on our fruit and orchard spraying from that standpoint. Also, we need to think about not just the boom height, but also the target um, um, and direction of the target from our booms and our, and our air blast and, and, of course, cannon sprayers and if we're using regular boom sprayers. Um, but there's interesting that you, you look at boom pressure and of course we're going to record, you know, calibration records the speed and the boom pressure and all these things. So it's good to have good working pressure gauges and to, to watch them. Um, you can see here in the cab, I don't know if you can see that or not, but there's a gauge right there, a fluid gauge that's connected. So you can have a pressure here, you have pressure, pressure gauge right on here, right there. And you, sometimes you can actually manipulate uh, with a valve the pressure on the go, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of us do that. We might want to do that if we know we're have a, a new block or an old block, small trees, young trees, we don't need as much volume. So if we've calibrated probably, we, properly, we can maybe jump up a gear and, and drop the pressure and spray the proper amount of, of fluid on a small block orchard versus something that's more mature. So again, calibration has a lot to do with that too. So uh, the amount of product that comes out of the tip. So here's a little question, just some sprayer quiz here. Why is spray pressure always more at the pump gauge then at the boom gauge. So what I'm saying is if you had a gauge out here somewhere versus a gauge here or a gauge here, why might there be differences between those gauges? Assuming the gauges are accurate within, within plus or minus one, why would there be differences? Because the one near the pump gauge is near the source. So Absolutely. So you're going to have higher, it's like taking your blood pressure here versus here. It's closer to the source. Absolutely. So we would expect, anticipate this to be higher. And I have found that on boom sprayers, it can be 15 to um, PSI difference between on the end of the boom and at the nozzle than at the pump. Of course, it'll be probably a little less at a high pressure sprayer like this where you we see less variability. So keep that in mind. Uh, uh, there's a lot of plumbing, there's friction, and you know, there's going through all the different nozzle bodies. There's also, or, there's also check valves on those no nozzle bodies as well as checks in the screens. So pressure can be a lot different. You need to measure the pressure at the nozzle. And you can actually slip on pressure measure, measurement um, uh, T-Jet makes a real nice one. It fits right over the nozzle, measures the pressure by these rising balls, and you ever see them? And they're pretty good at measuring actual nozzle pressure. So you want to know what your pressure at the nozzle is versus the pressure at the pump and make adjustments according. Because that way your book, sometimes you'll buy, you buy your nozzles based on this T-Jet catalog, right? And so you might, you might think, well, I'm not getting the output that the T-Jet catalog said that I was, was supposed to get. Well, you might check the pressure at the nozzle and find out it's 10 PSI lower. And that's the reason why you're not getting the output. And so again, so that's uh, real important. So m monitor makes them take time, like I say, to learn that sprayer real well. 
um, become, become, a, become a sprayer tech, <laughs> you know, and really, really think about all the things that are involved in that spray. Hey, this is nice. What, anyone know what that is? Yeah, that's your hand wash. That's your fresh water. It's nice to have when you're playing around with your sprayer, right? And especially if it's loaded, uh, loaded and hot, to have a little sprayer, a little wash area, so you can uh, get cleaned up. I have taken showers in the field with those things. <laughs> Wouldn't recommend that, but that, uh, they are nice to have occasionally. <laughs> and always have a clear, uh, uh, clean pair of coveralls <laughs> with you, just in case you need need to do that. Uh, so, those are just port important safety tips for. Uh, spray application. So we, we know that um, a lot of things can go wrong when we mix chemicals as far as compatibility. And what I have found that chemical mixing sequences um, are really important. So when you, when you mix products um, in your sprayer, especially when you're starting to put more than, let's say, five products together, more than three products together, there's a certain order that you're going to want to mix these. And I would recommend that you write that down and maybe even do a compatible jar test, uh, test before you do it where you put maybe a, little, a teaspoon of each one in a quart jar and shake, and then remember the order that you put them in. Because it's incredible uh, how we can get incompatibility. We've got a lot of new products coming on the market, a lot of different formulations, and no one knows exactly sure <laughs> if you put things in the wrong order how it might turn out. Okay, and you might have an unsprayable mixture, and then you really got trouble. <clears throat> if you do develop an unsprayable mixture, I find that hot water helps. <laughs> so a lot of times if you come up and something's not spraying well, get some heated water, dump it in the sprayer, get it out there until you get that mess cleaned out of there. So again, it's really, really critical. But I always say start with surfactant, start with water, fill your tank up about halfway, start with water, put surfactant right in there, get things in motion, get your agitation going, make sure the agitation is working. And, uh, and then go into wettable powders. And um, they, they're typically, you don't want to go from the hardest to mix to the easiest to mix. That's typically the, the pattern. So wettable powders, that's kind of like putting baby powder in solution, right? Those talcs are really difficult. That's typically what we're talking about. We're talking about a talc impregnated with chemistry, chemical. And that's what wettable powders typically are. They could be fine milk clays, but a lot of times they're talc. And so we know you take a baby, <laughs> baby uh, um, powder, and you, hit, you know how hard that was. You ever try to mix that in water? <laughs> well, thankfully, they put a little bit of surfactants with that wettable powder, so it actually tries to mix. But we do have a hard difficulty getting that one to mix. Right. Then, then dry flow was yes, sir. Question: How mm -hmm. about the idea of pre-mixing your chemicals in a separate tub before you put them into the sprayer? Does that help? Um, I would, I, I would be not inclined because concentrations would be a lot different, and uh, and you might get, you might actually have some antagonistic problems if you put more more concentrated products together. I would say dilute to, to spray. Do them individually. I would say, I would okay. recommend that, absolutely. Because solvents, you don't know exactly with the formulations involved in all the different products. And if you start putting things in more concentrated, you might get more, more potential for producing an unsprayable mixture. So I would say get it in the water with the surfactant, start with the wettable powders, work through the dry flowables, then the emulsifiable concentrates, and then the liquids. And then the fertilizers going last. Never put the fertilizers in first. You know, if anyone's ever used 2,4-D and used your ure ammonium nitrate, you'll know what happens if you put 2,4-D in your ure ammonium nitrate. Anyone been there? This is experience talking. <laughs> it's, it's a mess. It looks like oatmeal. Okay, so you put the 2,4-D in the water with the surfactant, then you add the UAN at the end, and you get a nice, beautiful solution. You do it reverse, and you've got oatmeal on the tank. And you need, you'll spend the rest of the day with hot water to make that thing spray. And so the difference is, is really, it's really is incredible. Um, sprayer, anyone have an unsprayable mixture? Have that, have, you, know, you know, I guess, but believe me, it can happen and it will happen. And, uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll just scratch your head when it happens and think, what in the world did I do wrong? <laughs> and it's, it's really pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, sprayer calibration, really it's a function of ground speed, right? And that's, uh, that's a direct, uh, direct correlation. The faster you go, the less you put on. And that's a one-to-one -one or direct linear relationship. Um, uh, pressure, of course, is very important. That's not a direct linear relationship. If you look at the nozzle, you'll notice that as pressure increases, you don't get a comparable or linear ex increase in delivery. So it's based on that nozzle orifice, and it's more of a kind of a curve, if you will. And you're going to plateau at some point. So nozzle output is based on nozzle orifice size, right? So we're looking at orifice size, we're looking at pressure, and we're looking at speed, and that's how you calibrate. And uh, we, we're not going to go into calibration, but, but calibrate when you change products um, and because density changes. And what I typically find is that even if density changes, 
Um, what you'll notice most is the pressure increases. And so don't drop the press, don't drop your, your pressure as you, as you, the density of the spray solution increases. So when you calibrate with water, you know, water weighs eight pounds. You might have 11 pounds or 11 and a half pounds of material, especially if you start adding some foliar fertilizers, you might get up to 12 pounds per gallon. You're going to notice that in a pressure increase. It'll probably be a substantial pressure increase because it takes more force to push that fluid. And what you're inclined to do is to drop your pressure and think that you're I calibrated at 45 PSI or 50 PSI with water, and all of a sudden it's saying 60 PSI. You're inclined to drop it back to 45 PSI, where you probably just dropped back to about 75% delivery. Okay, so keep that in mind, density and that. So calibration it has a lot to do with products. And that's why it's always good to go out and have a known area when you start new formulations to know you have a good acre block as a test, as a test so when you go out so that you, you know, I spray this acre and, and I, I wanted to put on 80 gallons, and I put on 80 gallons, you know, or close to it. So it's, it's good to know that. Farmer discovers a leak while spraying. What should he or she do? Call his neighbor. Call his neighbor, yeah, yeah. <laughs> put a flare up, <laughs> shoot a flare gun in the air. <laughs> no, um, you know, be ready is what I would say to that one, right? I mean, a pair of vice grip clamps, <laughs> you know, uh, extra nozzle bodies, you know. The sprayer. Yeah, shut the sprayer off, you know, make, determine if, how bad is this leak and, and how dangerous is this leak and what, you know, all those things kind of, kind of come in there. A lot, of, a lot of common sense, but if you're prepared, if you, have, if, you can, if you know what valves turn off certain sections of the sprayer, maybe you can just sit right in the tractor and say, uh oh, it's leaking on that side, it's got to be that side, boom, you slip that one off. Now you, at least you've isolated that leak, uh, you know, and maybe you just spray the rest of the orchard with just the one side of the sprayer, right? and get the thing empty, come back and make the repair. So there's things we can do if we, if we think, at least think about the process that might, a leak might occur <laughs> and, and a, the sprayer might uh, get in trouble. And so, I, you know, I've seen some pretty amazing things like, you know, you, you, you shove a piece of a branch in the tank where the, where the tank ruptured and keep on going. I mean, you know, there's a lot of ingenuity out there and maybe some of it makes pretty good sense and maybe some of it doesn't make too much sense. So. Uh, special maintenance, uh, rinse, and of course required checking, good time to check nozzle output and uniformity. If, if, it, if it varies by 10%, then it's time to, um, uh, to make the changes on that. Also clean and lubricate those pumps, and especially do that before you winterize. I think that's a really good time of the year to do it. Break things down in the winter. Uh, get everything ready to go for spring. New seals and all those things are great, great time. So you won't have those leaky pumps going out into the field. And of above all things, what happens at 32 degrees? I was a dairy farmer for 18 years, and we learned this lesson every year, I think. Oops. What, what is important at 32 degrees? Water freezes, Water freezes you bet. <laughs> and freeze does a lot of injury to sprayers. So um, undoubtedly, uh, take the time to make sure every nook and cranny and run some antifreeze solutions through those, uh, through those pumps and, and store them. And antifreeze also good rust inhibitors in it, too. So it's a good way to keep things from seizing up. Um, so what's the proper procedure for thorough rinsing of a sprayer? Uh, this is going right to private applicator training 101. You're looking for triple rinse? Triple rinse, there you go. That's, that's kind of critical. But what's really amazing about sprayers is that one thing I would say is never put, if this is going to be your um, vineyard sprayer here, never put herbicides in it. Okay, that'll keep you out of a lot of trouble, right? Have dedicated herbicide sprayers for laying down the herbicides, kind of like, you know, I, I use that little what is that, that 40 gallon little thing on the ATV, you know, to, you know, and that'll do an acre at a time, two acres at a time. And, um, you know, that, that way it's dedicated. The herbicides are dedicated to that, and I use the, the, the sprayers, the orchard and vineyard sprayers, I'm going to use that for fungicides and insecticides. That way I'm not going to at least damage the orchard or vineyard if I, but if you were inclined, if you were inclined to put herbicides in there and in the spring and use a little boom sprayer off that, because that's all you had, then you better make sure you triple rinse that sprayer. And I would recommend that you use a cleaner. And first of all, make sure that you take all the nozzle bodies apart and flush that through with water twice, then fill it up with cleaner and, uh, and, and let, then flush that through, let that sit overnight and then flush that through and then rinse it one more time, okay? That's four times if you counted. And I would say you're pretty good chance that you're not gonna have anything left in there to do any damage. So if you're really you're inclined to do it, and believe me, uh, if you don't do that, you will see damage. Roundup, is, with those new surfactant technologies in them, will hang in that tank forever. And so if you're not using a cleaner uh, to get that out of there, it's in there, and you'll see damage. Okay, so it's amazing as, um, how important that is. So here, here's a small scale. 
production. And uh, this is back in 1999. It's amazing I've been in this job for as long as I have already. That's me, isn't that hard to believe? <laughs> and uh, this, this is actually one year's growth. Can you see the good weed control there? Laid down with a hand wand. Those were, those were little sticks. Those were, those were um, two-year whips. They went in the ground. This is the fall, going to, not even fall yet. And that's one year's growth. And if you get that kind of growth, you better fruit the second year. And you get that kind of growth by not having any weeds in that area that you are establishing those roots. And we, of course, we had trickle irrigation in there, nursing those things along. And that's hot Southern Maryland. So, so if you keep them growing through July, you'll get rewarded with some amazing growth going, and actually time to fruit. And I did made a mistake down here, the V blocks down below. I made the mistake not fruiting the second year. And, I'll, and believe me, that, that's kind of sabotaged my own study by not fruiting a little bit the second year. So you live and learn um, when it comes to fruit production. Here again, close up of that sprayer. And now you can see the gauge in there and uh, the ability then to come in there. And even then, the, you know, you can use that hand sprayer for the, first, <laughs> for the first year, but you better be ready come second, third year, right? Those trees grow fast, don't they? And, uh, and so, okay, I got away with that the first year. That's how I sprayed that whole orchard block. Apples up this end and this fruit. I sprayed the whole thing by hand, right? But believe me, by the next year, I was ready for that rascal, okay? So again, we have to we keep in mind that uh, we use machinery uh, to take drudgery out of farming. You know, uh, you know that, that may not have been too much of a drudgery job and I kind of thought it was kind of fun, <laughs> but I guarantee you it wasn't, wasn't gonna be fun the next year, okay? So, so that, uh, um, you move on to this, and uh, again, knowing that machinery will make life very much more comfortable. Not only that, you're in a protected environment. This has got charcoal respiration, uh, charcoal uh, respirator, or uh, what do you call it? Filters, yeah, filters up in here. And so that way, at least you've got a little bit more clean environment. And uh, then you can actually take a look out the back, back of the sprayer, right, and see exactly where you're putting those. This is about three years now. You can see those V trees, and we've got you start to think about how much area you're actually spraying. And we're spraying, I would say probably, you know, we're up to almost uh, 10 feet, you know, like a 10, 10 foot area, that 10 by 10 or something like that. And that's how you actually quantify the amount of, of material, actually carrier it takes to get full coverage. So three to four years into that growth, that was probably about three years in, uh, we're at about 100 gallons. And, and you do that by tree height times width, okay? And so that's, um, that means that you need about 100 gallons per acre, and you've got about 25% of the area covered. This is right out of the, um, the Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia fruit guide, right? Up there you, the guy has it right in his hand. He could turn you right to that page there. So if you haven't thought about that, what happens when those, cherry, those peach trees get out here to where they're covering about 62% of the area? You might be up to 250 gallons to actually get good canopy, full canopy coverage, right? That's where you need those pull-behind sprayers that can deliver up to 300 gallons per acre, right, to make sure you're, you're getting full fruit coverage. So, so again, you can get by with those small sprayers, you know, up to 100 gallons per acre. That little tank holds that you just saw on the back of that. They work fine, but when you get up to several acres, that's when you get into those three 500-gallon machines, right? And that's, why, and that's, that's where you're at when you see the big pull-type sprayers. And so again, it's just a matter of scale, right? But it's also knowing how much material it takes to get full coverage of that entire canopy area. Preparing to hibernate. Any questions at this point? <laughs> the, um, how many of you have had, um, have, have been, I guess, had um, the sprayer technology not where you wanted it? You know, you think, oh, geez, <laughs> and the spraying's taking most of my time because maybe I need to invest in, you know, better sprayer, technolo better sprayer technology. So, again, the, um, I wanted to cover a little bit about um, laying down with the, the hand wands. The, um, I got, what I've got here is I'll do the show and tell now. I wasn't quite ready for it, but I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> the, um, I've got some different nozzles here. And, of course, we're really concerned about when we're laying down herbicides on the floor, we're concerned about products swirling up into and damaging potentially fruit or the canopy. And so what I have here are two different nozzles. How many of you have heard of the turbo T-jets and the, uh, of course, the comparing it to a flat fan, which you typically would use with a hand wand sprayer. So what I have here is water sensitive paper. And um, this is the turbo, um, turbo flat fan nozzle. 
a turbo design. It has a swirling chamber in there, and it actually produces much um, larger droplets. And so you can see that. You can get very thorough coverage with, when we look at the micron size of the droplet, um, we're getting up around 400 microns, which is fairly large, almost a coarse spray, but you get very good coverage. And when you're laying down herbicides, that's all you need. Okay, then you get into much finer droplets with the regular. These are both the same orifice size. They're both 805 nozzles. And 80 stands for the degree angle, 05 is the output. And, uh, and uh, then you see the differences in the droplet size. And you can imagine this droplet size here is going to swirl up into that canopy with just a little temperamental gust of wind. It's hard to know where it's going to go. And so again, just, just pass these around, the differences in nozzles. So if you're going to go with a different technology, um, when you're laying down, go with these new turbo uh, type nozzle technologies. The, um, thank you, Mike. Yes. You can use those nozzles in any sprayer, okay. right down to a hand pump. Because a lot of them have nozzle bodies on them now. It's not operating like yeah, it's locked. <coughs> yeah, it won't even up or down. So um, the uh, the droplet size, 400 microns. In fact, a lot of the materials now you're going to see labels requiring the droplet size stay above a certain minimum. And you think about a micron, just to put it in perspective, a human hair is about 100 microns in size. A staple, the diameter of a staple, is about 400 microns, and that's the droplet size we're looking for. And uh, if you look at the, the amount of drift that you get with a 400 micron droplet, the, the larger droplet, the, the one that's the diameter of the staple, the ones you see on the card that you actually see a nice splotch, um, that, that drift will be, um, can be as much as 30 feet off target with a 5 mile an hour wind if you're down in that 100 micron versus the 400 micron might only be less than a foot off target. So the differences in that droplet size is really incredible. Thanks, Mike. So um, let's go ahead and move all. Oh, I had to share it with you because I had a debate. This is pretty interesting. Uh, um, that, anyone know where that is? That's, that's Mount Hood, okay? And, and that, Oregon, that is the, the, probably the most premier pear production region, I think, in the world. Okay, you're looking at the pear valley of, off of Mount Hood. Glacial water feeds that. And, and what was really interesting, I, I presented that little sprayer sheet out there at the National Ag Agents meeting. And I had someone kind of ridicule me saying that I sprayed too much. And if you count that, that was 18 sprays. Okay, per season, dormant oils all the way out, 18 sprays by calendar pretty much. And I told him that's pretty much what we had to spray in the east. Well, this guy said, oh, my goodness, you know, that's twice, too many, twice as many sprays as we spray in Oregon. And, I, you know, I, how can I contest him, right? He, so he's saying, well, we sprayed nine times or eight times. Okay. Well, I got out here. Now, he didn't know I was going to take this tour. And I went out in Pat Pear Valley. And lo and behold, can you see that guy down there? Can you imagine what I wanted to talk to him about? <laughs> <laughs> He's out there spraying the pears, okay? And uh, here we, here we, this is pear. This is pears, a, few, a couple years old. These were, uh, I think, about 15-year-old Bartlett trees. Just beautiful pears. Here's crimson Bartlett's. They were about 20 years. Isn't that amazing? Just beautiful pears. And th the reason why they're so pretty, they're stark, 59 cents a pound. This is only a couple years ago. You can buy them all you want out there, cheap as can be. Um, but what was amazing about that, when I talked to those fellas, was he had all the same diseases and insects and fire blight in an area that doesn't even receive rain when the pears are on the tree. Right. It's just humid. Yep. And, they, and, and I talked to the grower. I said, well, I had a little debate in a presentation I just made, and the guy was talking about how many sprays. And I said, before I get into this, how many sprays do you put on your trees? And he, was, he said, well, I said, how many cover sprays? And we went through the whole list. I had about eight cover, seven or eight cover sprays. He had about five. So it came down to about four sprays less. So they were right down around 14 sprays, but not eight or nine like that fellow that was giving me the harassment that was all about. So I'm thinking it doesn't rain. We're in, the, we're in the humid East Coast, and it rains all the time, which means it's washing off everything we put out there typically when we're trying to protect those fruits. And they're spraying four, four sprays less in the best pear environment in the world <laughs> and using exactly the same products, had all the same problems. Of course, they're going to be amplified because it is such a community of pear production with pear and all these other things. So, so I'm just thinking, you know, hey, 
Um, don't let people fool you. <laughs> they spray. <laughs> and uh, even if you go out there where there's organic production, they're spraying. They're using a lot of sprays out there and even in the organic production regions. So, and we spray because we have all these problems, right? And so th this is nothing new to us. Um, you know, we need, to, we need to address these problems and stay on top of them. And if we do, it rewards us with that. And again, it's getting harder and harder to do that, isn't it? I find it with the insults that we have, with all the bugs chewing on everything, and it just seems insult and injury to try to keep this up there, and it's not getting any easier. And so I, I just want to say, but we do, have, we do have good reasons, right? That's some of the peaches we picked at Upper Marlboro on. And when, it, when you get a good crop in there, you know uh, that uh, you, know, you have something that's of value. Last thing I want to touch, and that was with those nozzles. Got another minute, Mike? And I just want to keep in mind that um, this is Dr. Angus Murphy's work. Uh, he's from Purdue. He's our new plant science landscape architecture department chair. And uh, 2,4-D, dicamba, and MCPP will not show up injury on your fruit trees, typically out to two to three days and most, sometimes even a week after the ins insult. Um, but what's interesting, if you go out that far and decide to sample those trees for those chemicals, you will not find it. It's not detectable. So what does that mean? What you're going to see because of this new dicamba spray technology that a lot of our corn and wheat and our corn uh, soybean growers are getting these dicamba resistant beans, dicamba resistant beans, they're actually going to um, recommend that you put these little um, test kits in your sensitive crops and pull those out when you know someone's going to spray. So you have documentation of drift. So keep that in mind. Be aware of that. That's something that's coming, and I just wanted to share that with you. But we can reduce drift by using that nozzle that I just showed out there. Even, and what I have found, it's not the other guy that typically damages our orchards and vineyards. Who damages most of our orchards and vineyards? Yeah, absolutely. We do. You know? And if we're, <laughs> we're most likely the ones that are going to swirl up that herbicide up into that canopy. And if we're using Roundup at all, shame on us, because that's like, that's like deciding we don't really want to get in the orchard or vineyard business to begin with. And so, so keep in mind that drift is a particle and vapor drift component, and it's all we talk. I just this is just a slide that I went over with earlier about the size of a micron. So just start thinking about and distance of drift. When you look at drift, five mile an hour per, per wind, three foot off the target. Um, those very coarse droplets or medium coarse droplets of 400, you get about a three quarters of a foot drift. Okay, so you're three foot off the target, going along with the wand, laying down some herbicides along your tree. If you've got that nice coarse droplet that's 400 microns, then you're going to most likely, with a five mile an hour wind, move maybe a foot off, or three quarters of a foot. Not likely to come up into the canopy of whatever you're spraying. Now, if you've got that ultra fine droplet and you've got some of those 200s, look at that, 5.5. Look at this, if you're producing that 100 micron droplet, 26 feet with that same wind. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go spraying, I don't typically find that there's no wind. You know, and so I'm usually out there spraying, and it's a little blustery. And, and so you think about 26 feet of movement with, a, with the ultra-fine droplet of 100 microns, and that's the thickness of a human hair. So sprayer technology is important. <laughs> and uh, put, keeping that product and putting it where you want it has a lot to do with droplet size. And if you're going to control drift, control your own drift. Worry about your neighbor's drift, but control your own drift first. You're more likely to damage your vineyard or orchard with the things that you put out there than what's going to come from somewhere else. So here's just a, uh, those, that flat fan, 150 micron droplets, 14% of them can be in that range. Um, these are the two um, drift reduction nozzle technologies, the Venturi and the Turbo. And again, look at that, only less than 2% are driftable fines of 150 microns or less, and almost 98% of them are 420 microns. Very determined droplet size. And if I had a visual, if we had that sprayer, sometimes we'll, we'll spray. I like to spray people a little bit and say, is that a fine? No. <laughs> if that, you can see the difference. You actually can see the difference. So that's kind of what those droplets should look like coming out the end of a, of a drift, drift control nozzle. Uh, very, very uniform. Very, and that's the kind of results you get, right? You get really nice laid down products, really good control out there. So that's it. Get your headline news. Sign up for that. Uh, we put that out starting in April through September, every twice a month, kind of a bi-monthly uh, update. And of course, Mike's a big contributor to that, and I thank him for that. And all those that I do the editing on that, send it out. So if you're not getting that, that's um, all I got, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for any questions for Dave. <laughs> on, on, uh, Roundup in New York. Yeah. Here's a big no-no, maybe. Well, yeah, absolutely. If, if you're not 
controlling that potential for that to either t contact green bark, especially young trees. Now I'm saying spot spraying is all right. I like wick bar applications. I don't like to spray it uh, around anything that I think I could get bark absorbed. That new translaminar technology on Roundup is so good at getting into plants and into bud tissue. And if you get it swirled up in any kind of green vegetation, it's going to be in the plant. What about systemic? You mentioned systemic. Well, Roundup is systemic, and that's the trouble with it. <clears throat> Once you get it in contact with any green tissue or even green bark, it's in the plant. And if it's in the plant, it has to be metabolized, and it's going to do quite a bit. It's a photosynthetic inhibitor. And so you lose the potential for that. You'll see it show up in that tree. The tree will yellow. It'll stunt. It'll stop growing. Yes. What about using some of the older generics? To, to well, that's safer. Plants? That's safer. And maybe with the older generic, the old 4L formulation, with good drift nozzle technologies and making sure you're not getting any swirl or movement up into those, and well avoid the trunks and things. But I would highly, if you're wanting to establish an orchard of Indian, I'd say keep the Roundup out. Use Gramoxin. Use um, 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 Rely, which is glufosinate, less likely to translocate. Better burn down options uh, for young for young trees. David, you've got to watch out for Gramoxin if you've got green bark, because it'll nail it. It will, yeah, you will see it, I but at least. nozzle didn't get shut off in time. It looks like you cankered the tree. tree. You, you bet, absolutely, yeah. especially young trees. But at least it'll scab over and heal. <laughs> we use but, hooded sprayers to get right up close. That's a good idea. Yeah. That's a real good idea. Absolutely. And they use rely for a vineyard. They use it actually for sucker control. So that's another option for that. For that. <coughs> Dave, can you tell me more about those, those kits to detect uh, where <laughs> yeah. to get them or how they work? I'd say contact Angus Murphy, Department Chair of Plants. Plant. Oh, so they're not available by sale? It's Purdue. He's worked out some. I just know that they're working out agreements with, uh, who is it, Dow, and is big in this uh, new soybean, um, dicamba soybean release. They're going to recommend uh, these kind of test kits. Uh, mainly the, the custom applicators are going to use it to basically protect themselves from false claims. Um, but also, I think it's very wise for all of us that grow sensitive crops to, to be aware of that. Yeah, what would you use? We have some older, older apples. And I don't even know what rootstock they're on now, but they're 35 years old. They've started to sucker from the rootstocks, tear from, just from the roots. What yeah. would you use to burn these suckers off? I don't know that there's anything labeled for that. I mean, we, we go in there and just cut them off with pruning shears, which is a really a labor yeah. intensive little thing. That's probably the only thing you I got. I thought I could burn them off with paraquat. Well, you could. I mean, um, that's, not, that's not a labeled use, though, paraquat. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to cut them off. <laughs> yeah. The other questions are Dave. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Dave.